Hello everybody, welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. Now, before we get started, make sure you're smashing that like button and subscribing to the channel. Every like and subscription helps build the channel. You know what's even better? Spreading the word to your friends about the best wine show anywhere. Well, welcome to Freestyle Friday, where I get to do what I want. Well, in this case, sort of. This is a review episode like I would normally do for Monday, or what I internally call Main Mondays. But it's somewhat of a special episode because of the tie-in that's going on. So what is that tie-in? Well, we'll get to that in a second. A few weeks ago, I was contacted by Rebecca from Donna White Communications PR firm about doing a review on some wines that are going to be part of a local promotion in conjunction with Earth Day. The main supermarket in San Antonio and much of Central and South Texas is HEB. And there are others around, but they're the big one. And they've been expanding to a lot of the state over the years. They and Veramonte will be promoting Earth Day during the month of April. I'm sure there will be other products in many categories that will be part of the promotion. And I'm sure that these wines will also be used in similar promotions at various supermarkets around the country too. I'll assume that you've at least heard of Earth Day. It's officially next week. If you're not familiar with it, then here's the quick version. It's a day, or now a few days, dedicated to focusing on the environment and the planet in general. The first Earth Day was on April 22nd, 1970 in the U.S., in 1990, it became a worldwide event. I've included links to the Wikipedia entry on it and the organization's website for you to learn more about it. If you want the detailed history, I suggest you hit the Wikipedia page. The organization's page does have a history section. You'll need to go to their About Us page, and then there'll be a button that says The History of Earth Day. One side note about this in my doing my research is that it was originally proposed to be on the first day of spring back in 1970, which was March 21st. It was switched to April because it was felt that it would have a better chance or the best chance of participation. The week of April 19th to the 25th of 1970 was late enough to not conflict with any spring breaks, Easter or Passover, and the weather would be better than in March for most of the U.S. April 22nd was a Wednesday that year, so it fell in the middle of the week. So what about our wines for today? They come from Vinedos Veramonte or Veramonte Vineyards a Chilean winery founded in the late 1990s in the Casablanca Valley or Val de Casablanca by Agustin Junaeus. If that name sounds familiar, he is the same person that also founded the Quintessa Winery in the Rutherford district of Napa Valley. They also own Illumination, Flowers, Faust, Leviathan, and now Benton Lane. Junaeus didn't just come out of nowhere. He was a former CEO of Concha y Toro in the 1960s and grew the company to its, in its early days. He then left his native Chile in 1971 to be the head of Seagram's wine division and later other wine companies. He's kind of a big deal in the wine world, and that's why I've mentioned him here. Plus, he is the founder of the winery. I have a link in the description to Hineas Vintner's website, so check them out. Now, Gonzalez Baez, uh, they were founded in Jerez in Spain in 1835. They bought the controlling interest owned by Hineas in 2016. Another family, the Rojas family, retained their existing stake at the time. They are an historic family who have been involved in Chilean wine since the 1870s. Now, I'm not sure if they still have that partial ownership in this, but uh, they may or may not. There's a link in the description below, also the full press release about the purchase of the winery. Now, Gonzalez Bias is best known for amazing sherries. I actually bought one of their VORS sherries recently. Now, VORS is a 30-year-old sherry. I haven't cracked it open yet. It will probably be a future review, maybe even a future Freestyle Friday episode or a group of episodes on Sherry in the future. Gonzalez Bias has many other brands they own, mostly in Spain. They also have a few spirits brands. I've linked to their website so you can check them out too. Now it's back to the star of the show, Veramonte. So for a long time, they've been one of the premier wineries in Chile. They also have the brands Ritual, Primus or Primus, and Nayan as part of their portfolio. Now let's get into the Google Earth video as I talk about the winery. As I mentioned earlier, Veramonte is located in the Casablanca Valley in Chile. This is where the Sauvignon Blanc comes from. 
The heart of the valley is about 45 miles northwest of the center of Santiago. The winery is in the southwest part of the valley. According to my research, Veramonte owns over 600 acres of vineyards in Chile. You'll see there are quite a few vineyards around the winery. As we fly over their main property, you'll see other vineyards around it. Not sure if they also own those vineyards, but I wouldn't be surprised if they do. Let's fly over to the valley where the Cabernet Sauvignon scrapes come from. This valley is called the Colchagua Valley or Valle de Colchagua. It could be Colchagua, I'm not positive about that. Anyway, it's about 95 miles due south of the Casablanca Valley. This is a much larger area that stretches, depending on whose map you look at, from the Pacific Ocean to the Andes Mountains. Realistically, and looking at a more detailed view on Google Earth, it starts east of a mountainous region along the Pacific Ocean and ends at the foot of the Andes Mountains. Let's talk about organics for a minute. Veramonte practices organic farming. Now, according to the press kit I received, Veramonte uses no chemicals in their vineyards. They also use canopy management to provide enough airflow among the grapes to help with disease pressure. That means no pesticides. Canopy management also manages how much sunlight reaches the grapes. You need to make sure that the grapes have some amount of shade. Otherwise, you run the risk of them actually getting sunburned. Also from the press kit, the vineyards are integrated into the natural corridors for wildlife and provide habitats that are hosts for beneficial insects for natural pest control. Sheep are also used to help with the grass and weed mowing during the spring. They have that added benefit of providing some natural fertilizer. Much of this is part of biodynamic farming. Now, there are some differences that are best left for a special episode on different types of farming and what labels mean. However, I will touch upon the labels for these wines. Now, I'm showing you a chart from the press kit that talks about organic and what that means in different parts of the world. The labels for both of these wines say, made with organic grapes. They also have both of the seals shown for Chile. Made with organic grapes has a specific meaning in the US. That means that at least 70% of the grapes are organic. Organic by itself is at least 95% and 100% organic is well, 100%. In addition to this, if a wine label says organic or 100% organic, it qualifies to have the USDA organic seal. If this is present, then the wine can also be labeled no added sulfites and should be under 10 parts per million. Otherwise, it must have no more than 100 parts per million and can only be labeled made with organic grapes. I'll have a future episode about sulfites, so stay tuned for that. I've linked to the USDA's website for more info on this. I've also found a Wine Spectator article from 2012 that gave me the background on the sulfites part of this, plus has more information about the 70% rule. Links in the description for those as well. Let's get into these wines. First, the stats of both wines, and then we'll get to tasting them. First up is the 2020 Veramonte Sauvignon Blanc. Suggested retail price is $11.99. 100% Sauvignon Blanc is the Val de Casablanca region. Organic farming is practice. The pH is 3.13, the residual sugar is 1.44 grams per liter, the acidity is 6.45 grams per liter, and the ABV is 13.5%. Next is the 2018 Veramonte Cabernet Sauvignon. Suggested retail price is also $11.99. It's 100% Cabernet Sauvignon. The Valle de Cochagua is the area. Organic farming, also practiced. It's aged eight months in neutral oak. The pH is 3.85. The residual sugar is 3.72 grams per liter, the acidity is 3.02 grams per liter, and the ABV is 14%. All right, let's get to tasting. All righty. So, a little Veramonte here. I'm excited to do this. So, using the blue screen again today because, well, it's green on here, it's all green in there. 
the, the blue and the pressable won't look as blue as it should. It's not so bad. I've used it for the last few episodes and uh, I kind of like the blue screen. It's kind of cool. My eyes uh, also changed a little bit because of the blue. Found out. Well, I knew that would happen, but I want to see what happens. It's probably hard to tell with the glasses on. All righty. And today I remembered to put my DJI Osmo Pocket up in the chandelier so that we can do some top down of the wines. All right, so we got that done. All righty. So when I originally said yes to do this episode, it was a while ago, not that long ago, but a while ago, I was like, yeah, you know, I'll need some content come around this week in April because, you know, I'm going to have all these other episodes that I'm going to be putting out. And then I kind of got delayed on putting all the episodes out. And so now it's kind of, well, I don't really need to record, but I need to record this because, well, it's Earth Day. I mean, it's kind of the whole point of this, of this whole, uh, episode or the whole reason they sent me the wines is for the Earth Day promotion. So, and I think it's pretty cool that they're doing that. Um, you know, I don't talk too much about this. I, I, um, but you know, as far as the idea of organic and biodynamic, uh, farming and all that, I'm definitely down with that. I also know that there's reality and that conventional farming has to be done, not just with grapes, but with other agriculture, um, in certain parts of the world, because that's the reality of what we need for our food. I won't get through the whole debate about that, you know, how much how much food we grow and, and distribute and don't distribute and how it's wasted. But in general, you know, I think it's, it's as much organic and bio that you can do, the better. All right. So let's, uh, I'm assuming my, uh, I'm assuming that's all going. I'm just going to double check real quick. So yeah, it actually was recording up until the point I said, I think it stopped. And then I futz with this and then I guess it stopped. Let's get into the wine. Um, yeah, let's get into the wine. All right. So, um, and I'm going to, I've got the, uh, got the iPad here so I can see how we're doing there. Okay, good. All right. So just looking at this wine, I mean, it's a, just a, just a, a typical Sauvignon Blanc color, you know, that a light straw color, a little bit of, a little bit of, uh, pale yellow in there, but it's, it's more of a light straw color. There isn't really much secondary on there that I can see as far as, um, as far as the color, it's highly aromatic. Like I can smell it from here and, um, which it should be Sauvignon Blanc should be a pretty highly aromatic wine, but it smells really clean. You've got, you've got that tropical fruit. You've got that guava, you've got that lemon lime, you got a bit of salinity in there, you got a little kiwi, papaya, that type of stuff, you know, more of a tropical fruit flavor or, or aromas. You've got some minerality to it. You've got this like, you know, wet rock type of thing, petrichor, you know, the, the, the smell after, after it rains, a little bit of orange zest, peach. It's just a lot of fruit. And, and none of these fruits are like, I wouldn't call them like overripe. they they have a, they smell a little bit like just ripe, like not, not sour, not underripe, but like just at that ripeness, like they picked them at the right, like the fruits were picked at the right time, right? Maybe a slightly little greener so that they ripened late so that they continue to ripen off the, off the tree or vine or ground or whatever. It smells really good. Yeah. Let's just get into it. So yeah, it's, um, super refreshing. It tastes really good. I mean, this is a twelve dollar bottle of wine, and you know, I think it tastes as good as some other stuff I would have. That Sauvignon Blanc that would be priced higher. Um, one of the great things about Chile is that it's still such a value wine uh, country. It it just costs a lot less in general to make wine down there, and even though it's imported and all that, plus I don't, there are no tariffs. Well. We don't have any um, excessively high tariffs with Chile either. So that's another thing to really look at. I know that as of the date of this recording uh, and, and when the, the episode is released, that the Europe, the uh, tariffs in Europe have been, well, I think, suspended for a few months. Um, but the wines that are in country right now 
are the wines that have the tariffs on there. So anything you're buying right now from France and Italy and I think Spain too, um, they're going to be higher because of the tariffs. Anyway, um, but just in general, it's just cheaper to make wine uh, in Chile and Argentina. So uh, both countries are, are good value plays. So Argentina is probably getting a little more expensive than Chile as far as a per, you know, comparable wines. So you totally should just check out Chile in general. But yeah, this smells really good. It tastes really good too. The fruit comes off a little tart. It's, there's a freshness to it though. It starts off in that kind of slightly ripe uh, category of the fruit and finishes just a tad tart. I think it's really because of the acidity. Uh, I mean, it's a pretty high acid grape, pretty high acid wine. So it's there. My mouth is definitely salivating. Um, so, but you have the guava, you have the kiwi, you have the mango, papaya, uh, lemon, lime. You have that little bit of chalkiness, a little bit of wet rock. Um, just easy to drink. This is definitely dry. I wouldn't. I, so if you watched my um, sweet versus dry from last Friday, um, you'll see that uh, you'll see that I talked about sweet versus dry and what, how people perceive that and why people call a wine sweet when it really isn't sweet. I, this would not be somebody. Somebody would not consider this a sweet wine. You would taste the fruit, but it would be really refreshing and crisp. Crisp is a great way to say high acid. Yeah, absolutely really, really refreshing. All right, let's get to the Cabernet Sauvignon. All right, so looking at the color, I would put this in that kind of medium plus. Yeah, medium plus range, uh, concentration of color. We'll call it more of a ruby, at least that's how, I, that's how I'm looking at it. It's pretty consistent throughout. Uh, there isn't a whole lot of staining on the glass. This is looks to be almost like a little bit lighter uh, Cabernet Sauvignon. Give me a second. I gotta, got some nose stuff going on. I'm gonna go and wipe my nose. <laughs> so color wise, uh, it does look to be somewhat of a lighter, uh, a lighter Cabernet Sauvignon. So they may not have had as much uh, maceration or extraction, which is totally fine. Um, it doesn't have to be inky, black, dark, opaque necessarily to be Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, so yeah, let's, uh, there's, yeah, not a lot of staining on the glass. So that's kind of cool. It's there, but it's just, it's not, uh, it's, it's almost Pinot Noir like when I look at the color. So I'm interested to see how the, how the wine's going to be. So definitely, you know, moderate plus on the intensity. It's not as intense on the aromas as a Sauvignon Blanc. You get this, um, blackberry get some black fruit it's it's ripe but it's not like a jammy ripeness at all i get a little bit of that bramble a little bit of like uh you're out in the brush out in the country kind of woodsy now remember this was done in neutral barrel so i'm not getting all those like whiskey lactones and vanilla and clove and cinnamon and spice baking spices the oak is really there to kind of soften things up um, there'll be some influence on it, not necessarily flavors, um, but there might be some influence on the tannin structure of the wine with the wood tannins. Just depends on how much was leached out of, from prior wines. And, um, it really just allows some micro oxygenation. There's a bit of earthiness component, like a forest floor. There is a touch of green. So Chile is known for making Cabernet Sauvignon and Carmenere that has elevated amounts of pyrazine or bell pepper or green pepper. I don't get a ton of that. It's because I'm looking for it. I get this more like kind of not quite herbaceous, but like a fern, a slight greenness, but nothing, nothing over the top. Let's check it out. That greenness is a little bit more now, but on the palate, the fruit is more of a dry nature. It's not super ripe. It's not, I wouldn't call it dried blackberry, but it's a drier, but ripe blackberry, like firm. Um, there's a touch of raspberry to it. It's somewhat old world like. It's not really, it doesn't really come across as a new world wine. You get that woodsy quality. You get that, um, just like a bitterness 
to it. Like, like you know, it's almost like it's almost like having bitters added to a drink. Kind of, it's kind of like an old fashioned in, in some way. Though I don't really get any orange out of it, but there's, and it's not like whiskey lactose, but they're like you know how bitters adds a bittering component to to it. It's kind of like, almost like an amaro, almost like an amaro. There's a slight, a slight, slight bell pepper in it. A little bit of fern, a little bit of herbaceousness to it. Forest floor, um, a little bit of dirt. It, it, it's good. It's a good wine. It's kind of throwing me off a little bit as far as what it is and how it tastes, but it tastes good. It's 12 bucks. Like, yeah. I mean, I'll have to say I like the Sauvignon Blanc better. I think it's more to my palate of what I prefer. Um, but I think this is a well-made Cabernet Sauvignon. You know, the residual sugar on this, I'm glancing at my notes, 3.72 grams per liter. It is not a high sugar wine by any means. I wouldn't necessarily call it bone dry, but it's still really dry. It's still a really dry wine. 14% alcohol, I can kind of feel it. Um, it's a high alcohol. I mean, <clears throat> technically it's a high alcohol wine because the TTB starts the um, start new tax bracket at 14% higher tax bracket at that point so that's 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 actual high alcohol but when we talk about high alcohol on the psalm world it's 14 and a half so this is you know medium plus and it's there it tastes good uh i like the wine i like the sauvignon blanc better but that's just my palate you may like the other you may like this one better than the sauvignon blanc it's all about what we like i like the wine no no question i'm definitely going to enjoy this at some other point at some point you know, that bell pepper is really starting to come through a little bit more. I think that the wine needed to need to air out a little bit, needed to open up. It's also softening a little bit. The tannin was a little harsher and it was the, the wine was a little bitter. I feel like the wine's opening up a little bit more. This happens a lot. And I've had wines, I, I probably should do something like this. I want to do an episode like this where I review a wine and then... X number of weeks, months later, I just open the wine and drink it with food, with a lunch or dinner, and just kind of do a reevaluation and see how much the wine may have changed. Because sometimes wines on my, the second time I drink them, uh, they still are good, or as good or as bad as I remember them, but sometimes they've changed for the better, sometimes they've changed for the worse. So, interesting to try that. I'm not sure I'll do that with these wines, but... At some point, I'm going to do something like that. Yeah, this wine just needed to open up. It needed to get aerated. It's it's getting softer and smoother. The, the fruit's getting a little more uh, prominent, a little more in balance. It's really, really weird. It's starting to taste more like a cab than before. It was tasting kind of like a cab, but a really rustic cab. It's The rusticity is kind of calming down, and, and it's getting more... Um, it's getting smoother, getting elegant. Uh, and the... The uh, pyrazine, the, the bell pepper component, is increasing a little bit. It's not dominant, which is totally fine. It doesn't need to be the doesn't need to be the star player, but um, my expectation is that it would be there. Um, also, I don't mind if it's there in California cab, as long as it's still a well made cab. All right, yeah. So you know that's that's gonna do it for today's show. Uh, if you enjoy what I'm doing here, make sure you hit the like button, subscribe, and tell your friends. And until next time. I mean, buy these Veramonte wines. They're really good. Later.